to welcome you to Primetime in the BU Library. This week, we're celebrating International Education Week. Um, I'm part of the study abroad office here, and so we've had different events going on um, every day this week, so we're excited to feature this presentation as part of the larger International Education Week. Um, this event here at the library is part of the Primetime SABU Library series, and that's designed to really feature the experiences and accomplishments of Bethel faculty, students, and staff. So it's a collaborative project between Front of the BU Library, faculty development, and other offices like ours. And um, after today, this presentation should be available online. You can watch. Um, coming up after Thanksgiving, in this space will be a presentation on Tuesday, November 29th, a talk about building community in an online environment with Jay Rasmussen, Joyce LeMay, Ripley Smith, and Matt Putz. Um, but today, we are excited to welcome seniors Matt Nelson and Nick Lowry as they share their reflections about exploring white privilege, systemic poverty, and Christian faith through their study abroad experience in Guatemala term. Thanks, Melanie. Hi, all. Uh, my name is Nick. I'm Matthew. Um, and we're going to talk about living the tensions um, through our experiences in Guatemala. Um, so we were part of Guatemala term in spring of 2015, so a year and a half ago now. It's hard to believe that it's already been that, that long ago. Um, but yeah, so come join, journey with us as we explore these things together. All right, first, I'm just going to give you a little bit of an overview of what Guatemala term actually is, what happens there. Um, four basic elements, having language classes in the city of Antigua, um, having a host home stays, a family stays in two different cities, um, doing internships through an organization called Students International, and then several weekend slash spring break excursions. So the city we spent most of our time in is called Antigua. Um, in Spanish, that means ancient, so it's an old city. Um, the streets are cobblestone, and uh, it's basically like a 10 block by 10 block city, about 45 minutes outside of Guatemala City. Um, so in Antigua, we took our language school classes. We were at a language school called um, Centro Linguístico Maya, um, where we received one-on-one -on -one tutoring from um, Guatemalan instructors. Um, so for most of us on the trip, that was our first time receiving one-on-one -on -one instruction for classes and for our Spanish um, in particular. Um, so it was a really cool like, opportunity to have our Spanish like critiqued very well and literally we'd just be talking and then like the instructor would be like, wait, let's talk about that. What did you say? And then you would think, you're like, what? Okay, yeah, let's work on that. <laughs> you know, so, there were, there were moments of critiques, but that was also a very fruitful experience because we had that one-on-one -on -one attention there. Um, yeah, and then it, as this photo up here is an alfombra. Uh, Antigua is known for its uh, Semana Santa celebrations around Easter time. Um, so just for it, over the course of like two days, um, around Good Friday and on the Thursday before, um, the whole city like pretty much like doesn't sleep <laughs> for two days and um, the, the people who live in Guatemala, or who live in Antigua, uh, many will make these alfombras outside of their homes um, and they're, they're like flower petals, um, pine needles, um, colored sawdust, things of that nature um, and they create these things and then the processions that come by um, which remember uh, the resurrection story and the Easter story um, they're walked over um, and it's just to honor um, the, the holiday in that, in that way. All right. Um, our internships uh, were in a small city that was about 20, 25 minutes away from Antigua, of um, I happened to be working at the carpentry slash applied sciences site. Um, mostly working there with those three guys. Um, the point of it, um, Marito, who's the guy in the back there, he's kind of in charge of it. Um, basically what he was trying to do is he was trying to create an opportunity for young men from the community to be able to come and learn an applicable skill that they could use outside of going into uh, some type of gang life or drug trafficking because those tend to be very influential 
in Guatemala, especially in the more poverty-stricken areas. Um, and then in the upper right-hand corner, there is um, my host home where I was living during the mo most of the six weeks while we were doing these internships. We were having breakfast at this point, just the classic, they call it chapin breakfast, uh, um, fried plantains, uh, black beans, and sometimes usually, well, tortillas come with just about everything. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, uh, for my internship, I worked in a microfinance ministry, so this is Miriam. Um, I got to partner with her in the, the microfinance ministry for uh, six weeks. Um, and basically, um, the microfinance ministry works as, um, it works through the church in, the, in Magdalena, um, and the folks who attended the church had the opportunity to, um, to uh, request a loan. Um, and this loan could be for anything from like, starting at uh, like a little store selling like clothing or like child's toys um, or it could be something more like agriculturally focused so um, the first person that i visited with miriam um, this elderly gen gentleman had taken out a loan like eight years ago to purchase a cow <laughs> and now when i was visiting him with miriam he had like five cattle he had um, chickens and pigs and so it's a really really cool practical way for folks to um, kind of have some have like a uh, just an extra push in like getting a business started or it just it's a good a good program which offers offers many opportunities for for people to start a business or um, like cooking classes or something like that um, and then this is my host family um, and the Santos family so And throughout the course of the semester, we went on several different uh, weekend excursions or trips on our own or spring break trips. Um, top left is probably most recognizable, that is Tikal. We got to spend an entire weekend there, which was absolutely an incredible experience to get a better picture of where the Maya people, who were the people that originally inhabited the Guatemalan area, um, it was cool to see um, a little bit more of the history behind that and like, see the richness of that culture that still has influence today. Um, top right there is a place called Simuk Champé. It's a very, very hidden away little uh, reserve um, where you can go and visit and swim in waters that are actually turquoise in color. I had to jump off a bridge into the river, got to go um, caving in some water caves by candlelight there, and that was very exciting and a lot of fun. And then probably one of the personal favorites from mine, um, Nick, myself, another one of the guys, and Kathy over here, uh, we decided to hike a volcano and camp near the top, and then we hiked up to the very top the next morning to see the sunrise, and that was one of the most in nature, one of the most surreal experiences I've ever had. It was exhausting, but it was very, very worth it. Okay, um, so one of the contexts that we had put in place, you guys may have seen on the signs, was talking about privilege, and so we wanted to get, just like, establish something of what actually is that, and so based on Merriam-Webster, just a right or an immunity that's granted as a peculiar benefit, advantage, or favor. So we'll be looking at that in a few different contexts and ways throughout our experience. Yeah, we also recognize that like even just hearing <coughs> even just hearing the word privilege for some of us kind of triggers a lot of different things. So we're like not sure what to think about it or um, like what experience are so oftentimes attached with that. So um, just to make a note that it's not something that we can necessarily just reduce to a definition, although it is important to have a baseline. Um, there's often a lot of experiential aspects that, that carry that. Um, so briefly, we want to mention um, some of our preconceptions before uh, beginning one wall term. Um, so I began my Bethel education as a Spanish major and a missional ministries major. Um, and. Uh, uh, yeah, I, was, I had felt a calling of ministry uh, on my life before I started at Bethel, and so I decided on missional men um, coming in. And then I had a previous experience abroad in Panama, 
um, the summer after my junior year of high school. We were just there for two weeks. Um, it was just a more like a tourist trip, like let's see everything that we can in two weeks. Um, and then we also had the chance to um, live with the host family for five nights, um, which was <laughs> quite an experience as a junior high school student. Um, but after returning on that trip, I remember thinking on the plane ride back, like, wow, could I imagine myself being abroad for a whole semester? Um, and sure enough, it happened. So, um, yeah, and then in regards to poverty, um, I grew up out in the western suburbs. Uh, I attended a school where there were not many folks of color. Um, and so, I, of course, like I received an education on like different dynamics and socioeconomic standings amongst folks in the Twin Cities and whatnot, um, but didn't have very much like lived experience um, or exposure to it prior to Guatemala. Yeah, um, I came into Bethel and didn't have a super clear idea of what I was going to study, kind of switched around a little bit and actually came into Guatemala term not having any idea what my major was going to be. Um, I had thought I was going to get a Spanish minor, that changed, now Spanish major, and then through the experience that I had in Guatemala, um, that inspired me to add an international business major as well. Um, I actually have two sisters that my family adopted from Guatemala 10 years ago. And so I had been to the country before, choice, but again, kind of like Nick, those were mostly tourist experiences. There wasn't a whole lot of like actually understanding of the culture. I spoke a zip of the language, so I really was just looking at things and didn't actually see what was there. Um, and very similar as well in regards to what poverty actually is and how much of an actual reality it is for people. I understood it in terms of numbers and in terms of like statistically when I look at a country like this percentage of the population is in poverty and this percentage is upper class, this percentage is middle class. I didn't actually know this is what poverty is. Um, and then we came in to the experience um, and people would ask us like, are you excited to go? Are you nervous to go? And yes to both. Um, I was excited but mostly because I thought the most I was going to get out of this was expanded Spanish abilities, which happened, but there was so much more to it. Um, and I was actually most nervous about missing things at home and missing experiences at home and missing family and like just fear of missing out with stuff that happens at home. And even though that was a very real question and fear, I think, for both of us, it was 100% worth it to like step outside my comfort zone in that sense and actually just get out there. Um, so we're going to talk about exposure to um, our topics in Guatemala. Um, so to set the scene, uh, we left the cities on January 29th. Uh, we arrived in Guatemala City later that evening um, and we had like a three three, four day orientation at a, a seminary in Guatemala City. Um, so one of the first things that we experienced uh, at this seminary was uh, a contrast tour, as we affectionately named the Sucker Punch Contrast Tour. Um, so basically, uh, we, on this day, uh, we started the morning, we were in a classroom, we watched a documentary um, on the realities of poverty and literally life in the Guatemala City dump. Um, and uh, at that point, it was very similar to our previous experiences in learning about these things because it was literally on a screen, and you know, it's just, wow, that looks, you know, that looks terrible. But there wasn't any lived um, interaction with it. Um, so we departed the seminary and we headed to the Guatemala uh, Guatemala City uh, Cemetery, which overlooks the Guatemala City Dump. Um, so this is the view from a corner of the cemetery. So um, below you can see uh, the garbage trucks and piles of garbage. And there are people scattered throughout that, this photo, um, who, who live in the dump. <laughs> um, and also you'll notice about here there are vultures and birds circling around. So it was, it was a surreal experience in that, you know, for a lot of us, myself, uh, it was like, wow, this is... How can this be real? 
<laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. Um, so after seeing this, we went to a mall called Kayala, which looked like this. <laughs> um, it resembled, you know, European architecture. You got these, you know, the lights up here to come on at night to give that nice ambiance. Um, you know, all these big fancy stores, most from America or like European um, or Europe, rather. Um, so uh, while we were on the sewer, we we kind of like we were given seven quetzales, which is the uh, currency in Guatemala, and um, that's about a dollar for your reference. And we were told to go purchase something in the mall. <laughs> so we paired up and we went out and we walked into like you know the ice cream shops, the coffee shops, maybe a store or two that sold clothing. Could not find anything that we could buy with seven or fourteen quetzales. Um, so and just for perspective, um, the people in the dump they make about six quetzales per day, just trading in recyclables that they find in the dump. Yeah. Um, so I remember like I was partnered with Aaron. And we had ended up purchasing a bag of cotton candy. <laughs> That's what we got. Um, I think other people came back with like gelato or you know just the smallest portion of something very small. Um, and we sat down on the steps of one of these buildings, and they asked uh, they asked us, "Where do you feel most comfortable? Like where do you feel like is home?" And we we're like, "Gosh, like here, right?" Because I mean, this is this is like sort of where we come from, right? Is like these nice malls, this retail, you know, all these all these different aspects that are represented in the mall. We're like, yeah, we feel we're at home in the mall, <laughs> um, and so that sort of introduced this idea of like this guilt, right? Because we were like, oh shoot, I must like, am I a horrible person because I don't like, I feel more at home in the mall instead of at the cemetery looking at the city dump, you know? Um, so that, that was probably the first time for most of us that we felt like this, it was like a well-intentioned guilt, you know? Like we didn't, of course we weren't trying to be ignorant or, you know, just forget about what we had just seen, but it was the first time for me that I was faced like, oh, this exists, I feel more comfortable here, now what do I do with that experience? As well as the fact that, um, they also asked us to look at who did we see in those two places, um, because what they were trying to do was give us an idea, of, like not just how these people live, but who they are, and like how the Guatemalan society is set up. And it's pretty oligarchical because when we were looking at the dump and looking at who worked there, it was a hundred percent dark-skinned indigenous people, and then we go to this mall. And everybody looks pretty much like us. They were all white, all Ladino, which is like a mix of indigenous and Spanish heritage. Um, and like a lot of those, we didn't see anyone who was even close to as dark skinned as the people that were in the dump, which was kind of shocking to see. Not just like there's this huge disparity between social classes, but what are those social classes based in? And it was really hard to realize that it's a lot of times race. Um, and so after this tour and everything, we spend, spent a couple of weeks at our internship sites. And Magdalena is a relatively impoverished town. It's not, not as much as the dump, but compared to anything that we had seen or experienced here in the cities or in our other um, experiences through our lives, it was a lot different than that. And what it was really hard to do is create a separation in our minds of me versus them, like these poor people, and just kind of generalize, gloss over them and kind of lump them into one category of these are poor people and they're poor because of the system and like, just completely depersonalize them in that sense. Um, it was um, going in and actually working with them really did a lot to 
kind of turn around that perspective and really see the humanity of these people and see they have really hard stories and they have really meaningful thoughts and like their perspectives are many times ten times deeper than my own. So it's kind of getting rid of that natural pride of just like this is like me coming into this community. Um, yeah. Yeah, and for me, um, as a missional ministries student, I was like, this is my first experience abroad on a missions a missions trip. It is, it is a, essentially a, a short term mission if you, if you look into the technicalities of it. But so this is my first experience um, doing ministry abroad, being a part of ministry abroad, and so I very much come into the experience of like, oh wow, like I get to give devos to folks, like I'm a you know, I'm going to get to engage with people for the first time, and oh my gosh, how wrong was I? Um, <laughs> one of the most memorable experiences that I had, um, and kind of having all that like come crashing down on me, um, was when we were doing a home visit. Um, we do a home visit to all of our borrowers, um, like Miriam would try to get to everyone um, over the course of three months. So. Um, we'd go in and we'd just check in on how are you doing and usually we didn't have to ask more than one question of how are you doing and, and, and the folks would they just talk and share about their lives and how is family life, how is work, how is, how is everything. Um, and uh, at a particular home visit um, we were with a family and the father of this family was, was very ill um, and it, he had been sharing about how his, he was having issues with his doctor and not being able to get the correct medication and prescriptions. Um, some doctors would like write him incorrect prescriptions or they wouldn't like follow up with meetings and um, and then the, so there's, yeah, there's just a lot of, of turmoil in addressing his health which was deteriorating um, pretty quickly and um, and uh, so after hearing him and his wife speak um, for so long and uh, their family, to give you a little more context too, they had a 16-year-old daughter who was just beginning her um, her school uh, to become a nurse, um, which came after like their Guatemala's equivalent of, of high school. Um, uh, and so the, this family was supporting their daughter financially for her to go to school to become a nurse. And my, how the, the mom and the, and the father were behind their daughter and her pursuing her career of nursing. It was, um, it was incredible. Um, and so, and they also had like a, a five month old child. <laughs> and so here you have two children that need to be cared for and, um, and you have the father who is ill and has all these expenses with visits and medications and whatnot. And, so you know, up front there, there's a lot of, a lot of things that need attention and resources, um, and as we as we heard him share, and then after as we were praying with him, um, this man had so much faith in the Lord. Like it was it was incredible incredible to me because I I was like honestly I of course I want to say that like if I was in his place I would be the same way, but I don't I would like I. Like I have to be honest with myself, and I don't think I would. Like at that point in time, like his faith and like trust in that, like God would provide things when they needed to to be fulfilled was was something that just blew my mind. Um, and so that kind of marked for me a, a processing of like how does how do we understand faith in America versus how did I experience uh, Guatemalan's understanding of faith. Um, which I'll come back to that later, but that was my first experience um, in something like that. It really started the process for me of, of considering oh. how are the dynamics of Christian faith different from here in the U.S. to Guatemala. And then there was also different types of challenges when we were living in Antigua. Um, it wasn't quite so much like an in-your-face, this is like a poor area. It's a pretty well-off city, more or less. They get a lot of their business from tourism. Um, and it's a very, very Spanish-based town. So there's like a mix of Guatemalan culture and culture from Spain, and then some other Western influences as well. 
Um, and it was, it caused a lot of questioning to walk around and hear and talk to people and see, like, really who, who does what. Because a lot of the business owners are either like the super, super rich upper class Guatemalans or a lot of times expats and Americans. Um, so all of these businesses and coffee shops and whatever you'd like to call all of those different things, a lot of that isn't necessarily based in a way that's actually bringing benefit to the people of the country, which was, for me, caused a lot of questions like, why is that? And starting to ask those questions and get a better perspective of how people even here can influence Guatemala simply by anything from purchase choices, which is like the classically quoted one, like buy fair trade. And like I'd heard that before, and it was like, yes, that's great, but this other thing is cheaper. Um, and so for me to go in and actually see, no, this is why you have like that as actually important and how there's actually such an interconnected um, piece between the two countries. Um, seeing those things is actually what inspired me to even add international business as an area of study, um, which I wasn't expecting because when you hear Guatemala term, you think Spanish, or it's often uh, equivocated with um, either education or social work. And so actually seeing an interest in business and seeing how like, business students can fit in there too was a bit of a surprise, but it was very, very powerful as well. Just to see how that like, guided my own passions and my own um, desires to uh, find my place of study. Um, so coming back to Minnesota. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think this question really articulates kind of our, at least Mateo and, I, and I's experience coming back, um, is home where the heart is. Um, cultural readjustment was a difficult process, and I'd say it probably still is. It's something that you almost relive in different ways every day. As you stopped. Right. It's like in the DC, when you see all the food, when <laughs> the days when they weigh all the food that you didn't eat, you know? It's like different experiences like that that like trigger these like almost like reintroductions of how do I cross this Guatemala term in light of what I'm experiencing here at Bethel. Um, so prior to coming back, we had talked about different ways that we may react to being back in our, in our culture. And um, one of the, the two most prominent ways that I reacted was attack and um, like withdrawal. Um, attack and like, it was all internal, like, you know, like, see people with all this food on their tray, for instance, in the D.C., or, you know, like, people spending money, like, just in crazy ways. So there's, like, little experiences like that. I was like, what are you doing? Like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, there are people, you know, whatever. <laughs> so those were my experience and my reactions, rather, to, to being back in the U.S. for the most part. Yeah, and I, I had a lot of similar reactions. I came back, and the next day, came back to Bethel, just to see friends and everything, go into my old room to where my roommates were, and one of them came in five minutes later and I was like, guys, I just spent 45 bucks on a pair of pants. And I was like, how much? <laughs> um, because like coming from a place where $45 could really go so far, and coming back and being like, okay, in American culture, what do we spend money on and how much do we spend money on? I was like, wait, what is, what does that actually mean? And then I actually had like a complete emotional breakdown when I sat down with my mom a month later to start planning out like student loans and finances for my next semester at Bethel. Because I was like, oh my gosh, in the matter of this many months, I'm about to spend more money than some of these people might ever make in their whole lives. And that was a big punch to the gut and it took me a while to understand, okay, what are my and this was where the tensions come in. What, how do I deal with the fact that I, just by living here in the US, there is some privilege there. Like, I have the opportunity to go to college because I have a family that has um, the opportunity to send me to college. And that was difficult to overcome. Um, and 
in the some sense, it made me want to just, like Nick said, just withdraw and just not deal with anything, or just like lash out when people just made comments that I saw as careless without like taking a moment to understand. Well, I, they don't have the experiences that I have. Like these things that I saw and these things I felt and experienced, these conversations that I had that meant so much to me, other people didn't have those. And so one of the big challenges with coming back and people ask, how was your semester here? It's like, well, let me tell you, it was great. Yeah, um, actually coming up with a good way of trying to sum up these things that ended up impacting my life so much was difficult. Um, and just f trying to find common ground with people here um, at Bethel even. Like, one of the things that was mentioned in debrief was when you come back, how are you going to come back to Bethel and not just look at it as a place that's filled with ignorant, rich white kids? And now it's like, oh gosh, how do I do that? And like, I don't know that any of us feel like we've really done that perfectly. Um, but coming to just see my experiences as a way that can motivate me and push me forward to actually like ask a question or make a comment that can try to make someone else start to think and start this process that I am a little farther along in, in some sense. Um, basically seeing the world, um, not seeing my perspective on the world as the entire world. Like I have this expanded perspective, yes, but the expanded perspective isn't the whole perspective. There's so much more that I'm missing, and so coming into it with a humble attitude of yeah, I don't know at all, but can I share with you what I do know? Um, getting, getting across that line was, was key. Yeah, and those were those also offered, offered opportunities to start to question things like, for instance, with my experience with um, this family in Magdalena, um, thinking about faith back in the U.S. Um, one of the things that I, I just kept running into um, was how we understand blessing, um, because we see it everywhere, right? Hashtag blessed with a Starbucks caramel macchiato, whatever, you know, like, <laughs> I, I remember seeing things like that and I was just like, this is not, that's not being blessed. <laughs> like, yeah, it's great. You can say it's a great drink, but I don't think that's a blessing from God. Like, and so for me, it was little things like that um, where I started to reevaluate, like, what does it mean to actually be blessed by the Lord? Um, and in terms of thinking about my experiences and interactions with other folks in Magdalena, I came to the conclusion that it's like a blessing is something like that increases our faith, like that offers opportunities for our faith to grow and for that to be an even like stronger, more central part of our lives. Because for every person that I met in in, or in Magdalena working in microfinance, they had a faith that I was like, I, I aspire to have a faith like that because the way that I'm told to live in America is that, you know, my my hopes and value and everything that I do is in the things that I have and the accomplishments that I make, where I work, you know, the family, all that stuff. Um, but there's something about the folks uh, that I was able to, to meet and hear their stories in Magdalena that, that showed me that it's, it's about like, how, how do you walk this journey of this life with God um, in terms of your Christian faith? All right, yeah. In the interest of time, we'll kind of just make this lesson fast. Um, we basically came to understand our role here as being a mediator between the reality we experienced before coming to Guatemala and that mindset we'd had then, mindset we had in Guatemala. And like as we started understanding things, started to understand things and like get an idea for that culture, and like we have these two different realities that we feel really torn between, and so like kind of finding a way to bridge those gaps in uh, friendships, uh, bridge those gaps in thought processes and how we continue to look at academics and um, if you can go to the next one. Um, this quote was something that really kind of struck home with me as we were in debrief. Um, wanting to alleviate pain without sharing it is like wanting to save a child from a burning house without the risk of being burnt. And I feel like that kind of sums up very nicely for me, at least, what this whole experience came to mean. Uh, like, I've, I, I want to like 
come to a place where I can understand these other people's lives and their realities and even just being inspired by their faith and actually put myself in an uncomfortable place where I can ask questions of myself and like start to challenge myself because I can't actually empathize and like I can't be at a place where I can really converse with these people if I'm not willing to question and not willing to even change my own mindset. Any questions? to be able to share this all with you.